Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Logan for Liberty podcast. I'm coming at you from the Pacific Northwest, deep in the heart of Oregon. Hell yeah. How are you all doing? I hope you all are having a great day. Right now, it's su- it's sorry, it's not sunny. It's raining. I can't distinguish between the sun and the rain. Right now, it is raining outside. Not too bad, actually. The raining has stopped, but it's still overcast and it's still wet. So, you know, I'll make the best of my day because that's what I do. I make the best of my situation. If life gives me lemons, I'll make lemonade. If life gives me shit, well, I'll convert it into water like Bill Gates. So, I want to start off with this. Well, let me just tell you what we're going to talk about. We are going to talk about um, machine guns. We're going to talk about Donald Trump's uh, militarization of the border and him wanting to use the National Guard. So we'll talk about all that fun stuff. We'll start off with the most fun stuff, and we'll talk about machine guns. If you were to resurrect Thomas Jefferson and give him a machine gun, his name would be Austin Peterson. Austin Peterson, the 2016 runner-up for the Libertarian Party presidential nomination and current contender for the Republican nomination for a Senate seat in Missouri, has always believed in free possession of fully automatic weapons, machine guns for American citizens. As he reminded me in a phone interview this week, One of his colorful slogans during his Libertarian Party run was, I believe in a world where gay married couples are free to protect their marijuana fields with fully automatic machine guns. So, Austin Peterson seemingly understands the point of the Second Amendment. Now you can say, well, he's obviously biased, he's a Libertarian, so of course... He is going to interpret the Second Amendment in that manner. No. (laughs) You don't need to be a Libertarian. You don't even need to be a Republican. You can be a Democrat and still understand the point of the Second Amendment. You would be on... You would have a foot to stand on. If you said, I understand the point of the Second Amendment, but I disagree with it you would be on better footing. So his rhetoric is also consistent. Because, first of all, gay married couples, that is something that libertarians are okay with. Not necessarily, not, okay, let me, let me dive into that. Let me dissect that a little bit. Not every libertarian is okay with gay marriage. There are social conservatives among the libertarian party. But <clears throat> there is a distinguish there's a distinction between a libertarian social conservative and any other social conservative or somebody who agrees this way. You can be personally and morally social conservative, but there are people, despite being socially and culturally conservative, they are not politically conservative, socially conservative. The difference is, is you may disagree with gay marriage. You may think that gay marriage is reprehensible or that it's a slap to the face of religion. But you don't think it is the government's job to go in and keep two people who love each other from signing a contract. I fall somewhere in between. I'm not offended by gay people. I don't want to see it. Like, on TV, I'm not going to go seek out movies or TV shows about gay people. That's not the lifestyle I choose. That's geared towards gay people and, in my opinion, weird people who want to see gay people. Whatever. Do what you want. I guess there's a market for that, so go for it. But, like, but I'm not entirely like, oh my god, gay people, they just offend me. They offend everything America stands for. America stands for. Eh, whatever. Do what you want. Do what you want. That's my opinion on the matter. 
I do think it's unnatural. I know somebody out there is going to be like, well, animals practice it, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but animals will never pass out the real thing. Dogs, dogs are a great example. I'll tell a story about my dog later. And so, I believe in a world where gay married couples, we went over that, are free to protect their marijuana fields. So, he's saying that marijuana should be legalized. That as a form of income, you should be able to grow marijuana and sell it. In my opinion, that's perfect. I would rather have a farmer grow marijuana or an individual operating under rule of law grow marijuana fields because that is clean marijuana. I don't like marijuana. I don't like the smell. I don't smoke it. That's it. That's what it is. But I will not use the force of government to come and force you not to smoke marijuana. It's your body. You do what you want to as you wish. We could talk about laws regarding driving under the influence of marijuana all day. It doesn't make a difference. With fully automatic machine guns. So not just guns. Not just guns. He's not just saying guns. He's saying machine guns. So in his eyes, not only can you own a gun, you can own... A gun that shoots more than one bullet with one pull of the trigger. So his rhetoric is consistent, which is something that I like. I like a politician who is consistent. And that, for you folks, is a libertarian. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I've been saying this for years, Peterson notes, but he felt inclined to say it again in the past week. Because his most prominent rival vying for the GOP Senate nod, current State Attorney General Ho Josh Hawley, on the day he declared for the nomination, he also declared for banning firearm accessories via executive orders. He's to the left of Obama, and he made it important for me to differentiate myself. So, Austin Peterson unlike Josh Hawley, is actually being consistent with the GOP platform. Read the GOP platform. I challenge every single one of you out there to go read the GOP platform. And you know what their platform says? Two things. It says two main things. Constitutionalism. And that's in the preamble. Constitutionalism. And then in section three of the GOP platform is the second amendment. I want to make that clear. I want any libertarian out there who is listening to this to go look at the GOP platform and tell me if half of that is stuff that you agree with. I guarantee most of it will be stuff you agree with. And then you're going to look at the GOP politicians and you're going to wonder to yourself, what the hell are they doing? And I would say, that's a good question. <laughs> it's one thing for someone from the knowingly radical for freedom libertarian party to say that sort of thing but such an attitude is rare among would-be candidates for the major parties still Peterson is confident that doing so in the context of the fight for the GOP not to run against a Democratic incumbent Claire McCaskill will help not hurt not just Republicans but even Democrats in Missouri are pro-gun, Peterson says. The Missouri Senate voted to nullify federal gun laws in the state. We have permitless concealed carry as well as open carry. In response to Democrats pushing hard left and saying we should repeal the Second Amendment, Peterson says that we should repeal the 1934 National Firearms Act, otherwise known as the NFA, which, among other things, placed strong licensing and tax requirements on machine guns, and also repeal the Hughes Amendment to the 1986 Firearms Owner Protection Act, which barred all possession of machine guns, made after its passage. Second Amendment advocates need to stop playing defense and go on the offense, he tells me. If they are about repealing the Second Amendment, let's push in the opposite direction, 
the best defense is a good offense. So let's talk about repealing the NFA and the Hughes Amendment. <clears throat> so Austin Peterson, what Austin Peterson understands is that this is a battle of inches. We need to rally the cats that are libertarians. Libertarians are often compared to cats. This is a little off topic, but it's relevant to my point. P libertarians and cats are compared. Because libertarians are so independent despite being the same. They're the same but so different that it's hard to rally them. And if you ever do rally libertarians, I don't know if this is true in person. I haven't seen it very much in person. I've seen slight disagreements in person. Nothing, nothing crazy. But on Facebook, in any libertarian group, there is such a huge amount of infighting that you're looking around and you almost feel alone as a libertarian. And you almost feel like it's hopeless. And maybe it is. But Austin Peterson understands it is a battle of inches. If something is better than what it is before, take it. Seize that ground. Seize it. I highly recommend you watch Austin Peterson's uh, interview on the Glenn Beck program, on the Glenn Beck show, on The Blaze. You may not like Glenn Beck. That's fine. You may not like Glenn Beck's policies. That's fine. But watch his interview with Austin Peterson. Austin Peterson makes a great point about how socialists, big government activists, have seized so much ground because they took every inch they could get. Because they recognized, the Fabian socialists recognized, that an inch in the right direction is better than no inch at all. So Austin Peterson understands that this is a battle of inches. And he is willing to put his opinion out there. And have it be known so he can rally people who support his cause to vote for him. Especially in a time where it seems like even Republicans... <clears throat> sorry. Where it seems like even Republicans are going in the opposite direction of gun control. Despite them saying they would not. Despite them saying that they supported the Second Amendment. They clearly don't. Peterson recently got himself into a Twitter squabble with gun control advocate Shannon Watts that dragged in television personality Montel Williams. Peterson thinks Watts made a fool of herself by prodding him about ordinance and nukes, which are matters not relevant to the NFA. Peterson doesn't think in a favor appeal is that out there a position, pointing to a White House government petition to do so. With over 285, or sorry, 285,000 signatures. I don't know why I said sorry. I screwed that up. Just click off this show. <clears throat> it's time to stop placating people, having a conversation about how to limit our rights. Let's get the conversation to where people are talking not about limiting gun rights, but expanding them. And that's what I'm trying to do by calling for NFA repeal. He's running Republican, Peterson says, because thousands of phone calls made to his past supporters from his Libertarian Party run showed that nearly all of them wanted him to wave the GOP banner. But that doesn't mean his fans don't have a hardcore, radical streak when it comes to Second Amendment liberty. Dollars talk. We had our single greatest fundraising day after reiterating his support for private machine gun ownership. We got a lot of attaboys, and as far as anger from the left, well, those people weren't going to support me anyway. Missouri is a pro-gun state. We don't have a lot of gun grabbers. This is an important thing for me to highlight. What Austin Peterson said is something that all Republicans need to understand. Republicans will gain support for being pro-Second Amendment. In the state of Missouri, Austin Peterson over in this short period of time after he said one specific thing 
dwarfed the amount of donations he got before he said this one specific thing. And that was advocating for machine gun legalization. The reason being is because you're at the ballot. Let's say it's the primaries. You're at the ballot or you're at the polls. You're, you're about to vote. On one hand, your core issue, by the way, is the Second Amendment. On one hand, one Republican said, yeah, I support the right for you to bear arms. And then you don't hear anything else about that, which leaves the door open for those people saying, we don't want to grab your guns. We just want reasonable gun legislation. We all know what that means. Reasonable gun legislation is an inch towards the direction of tyranny. It's an inch towards banning, quote, assault weapons, unquote. That's, that's what it is. Let's be honest about that. But on the other hand, you have a Republican who's saying, yeah, you can own a machine gun. Maybe, maybe James Madison would be the type of person I would compare Austin Peterson to. Because James Madison wrote, wrote in a letter basically saying, yeah, you can own cannons. Is that a joke? So let's continue. Peterson pushes back against the idea that advocating private civilian machine gun ownership is unbearably eccentric in the current gun control debate. I want to bring the conversation back to our rights rather than being about trying to justify why I need something. Why don't I tell why don't you tell me why I can't? Beautiful. Beautiful. Okay? <laughs> We have people that are telling you that you can't own a gun or asking you, why do you need a gun? Now, Austin Peterson's attitude about this is, tell me why I can't. Because I'm going to. <laughs> and his whole attitude, okay, let me just say it one more time with a different choice of words. Austin Peterson's attitude isn't, it's not, it, this is what it is. It's about, I may not be allowed to, but who is going to stop me? That is something I want to hear all day, every day. I want, I want the entire house filled with Republicans like him. Maybe libertarians will actually flock back to the Republican party or flock to the Republican party. Maybe we'll see that. Why don't you, why don't you actually advocate something radical? like a real Republican, and then do it when you get to the house. This is insane. <clears throat> when challenged about why he can't support reasonable gun control, Peterson counters cheekily when his belief in reasonable new laws like the Hearing Protection Act to allow for the sale of suppressors without a tax stamp, basically treating suppressors the same as long guns when it comes to legal hoops and national concealed I can't speak reciprocity among states. This is amazing. He this is a guy who has done his homework, has heard the arguments, and has come with clever, witty responses that err on the side of freedom. Why can't I support reasonable gun control? Well I do support reasonable gun control. I support the Hearing Protection Act to allow for the sale of suppressors without a tax stamp. That's reasonable. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's that's amazing. To me, that is 100% beautiful. Send Austin Peterson to Washington, D.C. And make regulation meet his little friend. The spirit of 1776, the swag of 2018, what could go wrong? Nothing could go wrong, ladies and gentlemen. That is Austin Peterson for you. You know what else Austin Peterson is? The love child of Ron Paul and Matthew McConaughey. I'm cool with it. It's none of my business, like I said before. And guess what? I like the product. So some of you out there who have never heard of Austin Peterson, let me tell you a little bit about Austin Peterson. 
Austin Peterson, as we just went over, ran for the Libertarian Party presidential nomination. He ran for president as a third party on the Libertarian ballot. So, at the Libertarian National Convention, they ended up voting twice. Because after the first ballot, they couldn't really determine a clear winner. They had to get, you had to get a certain threshold. Even if you got more than the other candidates, you had to get past a certain percentage to win the nomination. And the reason is, is because they want to unite people. So on the first ballot, Austin Peterson got 21.30% of the vote. Which was second place. On the second ballot, Austin Peterson got 21.88% of the vote, still getting second place. But what's amazing about that is he gained he gained a 58%. Sorry, I had a brain fart. He gained a 0.58% increase in votes on the second ballot compared to the first ballot. Meaning, people liked him, and when they when they saw the amount that Gary Johnson got, he got forty percent of the vote the first time. When they saw that, people were like, "Oh shit, let's uh stop voting for this guy. That's getting less than twenty percent. Let's go for Austin Peterson." They did not want Gary Johnson. <laughs> it was pretty divided, actually. If it was just Austin Peterson and Gary Johnson, as opposed to the to uh, Gary Johnson, Austin Peterson, John McAfee, and other. I bet you Austin Peterson would have won. <clears throat> and in my opinion, he should have. Austin was born in Independence, Missouri. Coincidence? I think not, but whatever. He is now running on the Republican platform, on a Republican ticket. So let's go over some of the things that he believes in. And you can look up on AustinPeterson.com. And it is S-E-N, not S-O-N. P E T E R S E N dot com, Austin Peterson dot com. Go and look at what he's running on, on the promises that he's running on, on the things that he advocates for. Let's look at that real quick. He is supporting a clean repeal of Obamacare. Unlike uh, what the Republicans currently in the House ran on, but couldn't get done. He wants it legal to buy health insurance across state lines. He wants to bring competition back into the healthcare market so you can have lower premiums. If I, an Oregonian, wants to buy health insurance from Texas, from Idaho, from Florida, I should be able to. It is 2018. That is easier to do than it has ever been done before. He wants to end bailouts and subsidies to wealthy corporations. It is important to note that the only donors that Austin Peterson has is from individual people. <clears throat> it's not from special interests at all. He wants to reduce government spending. Bravo, bravo. You see, in the Republicans in office, they f fiddled with the tax code a little bit. Yeah, some people are gonna get more tax money but they didn't cut spending. A tax cut without cutting government spending and increasing the deficit, therefore increasing the national debt, will boost the economy a little bit. It'll, it'll kind of shove it in the right direction and make everybody feel good for a while. But without a cut in government spending, the economy still is not gonna do it. There's really no proof that there are long long term benefits of cutting taxes without also cutting government spending. <clears throat> Austin Peterson also wants to end the dangerous and costly war on drugs. America first, no nation building, national defense, not national offense. That is what Austin Peterson believes. And to add a little cherry on top for some of you conservatives out there, Austin Peterson is pro-life. That sounds like the perfect candidate 
running on a Republican ballot, in my opinion. He supports the GOP platform, and he is pro-life on top of that. Ladies and gentlemen, Sin Thomas Jefferson, I mean, uh, Ron Paul and Matthew McConaughey's kid, I mean, Austin Peterson to Washington, D.C. Let's do it. All right, let's talk about story number two. So I live in Oregon. I never thought that I would agree with my governor on anything. Oregon Governor Kate Brown, Democrat, said she would reject a request from President Trump to dispatch National Guard troops to the U.S.-Mexico border. If at, she tweeted, if at real Donald Trump asks me to deploy Oregon Guard troops to the Mexico border, I'll say no, Brown tweeted. As commander of Oregon's Guard, I'm deeply troubled by Trump's plan to militarize our border. She added, there's been no outreach by the president or federal officials, and I have no intention of allowing Oregon's guard troops to be used to distract from his troubles in Washington. <laughs> Leave it to a left-wing Democrat to reserve power for the states and not the federal government. Leave it to Donald Trump to make me agree with a left-wing Democrat. So let's continue on. <clears throat> Trump on Wednesday signed a proclamation ordering National Guard troops to be sent to the U.S.-Mexico border to address a surge of illegal activity and a memo to Defense Secretary James Mattis and Homeland Security Secretary Kirst Jen Nielsen, Trump ordered the National Guard to be used to secure the border to stop the flow of deadly drugs and other contraband. Gang members and other criminals and illegal aliens into this country. Trump first suggested Tuesday he'd like to deploy troops to the southern border to secure the area until his proposed wall can be built. Trump in recent days has been tweeting his frustrations about current immigration laws. He has warned of caravans of migrants approaching the border and called on Congress to enact tougher regulations. <clears throat> so here's one thing that I think we most normal people, I guess I'm being a little rude, this is something that I think libertarians, liberals, and reasonable conservatives can agree on. Despite what you think about immigration or border control, here's a few things that we can do to disincentivize illegal immigrants who want to cause problems. That way, the only immigrants that are coming are people that actually want to start a new life. People that want to better themselves. People that want to take place on the free market of ideas. People who are conservative, by the way, immigrants are conservative. They're family-oriented. They work hard. I don't get... I do not get why Republicans now are against immigration. So there's things that I think we can do. I think we can make immigration better, safer for the American people, safer for the immigrant as well. Let's end the war on drugs. I know that sounds crazy, and I used the word reasonable earlier, but why should we end the war on drugs? Well, instead of people looking to drug dealers and pimps to get their drugs, guess where they're looking to? They're looking to pharmacies. And guess what comes on pharmacy drugs, on pharmaceutical drugs? Labels. You have a number to ask questions. You have the dosage. You have the directions. You have the warnings. You have... You know what each dose is going to do to your body. You know what you are buying. You know it is untainted. You know it is clean. It is safe. And I know some people out there are saying, Oh, drugs are reprehensible. And it will destroy the social fra fabric of America. Or it'll make people lazy. Well, guess what? Ending the war on drugs will save us $44 billion and add an extra $44 billion in revenue. Where am I getting my numbers? We spend $44 billion dollars on the war on drugs. And if we taxed all these drugs the same way that we tax other sins like marijuana and alcohol, we could potentially we could potentially 
raise $44 billion in revenue. <clears throat> say, say you're on drugs. Or say you're in a state where marijuana is legalized. Legalized. Where are you going to buy marijuana? Are you going to buy a 20 sack from a drug dealer who you've never, who you might have met, but you're going to buy it from a drug dealer, or are you going to pay a little extra to buy it from a dispensary where you know it is clean, where you know it is safe, where you know you won't overdose on something laced into the marijuana? So let's get rid of Jeff Sessions, the guy who wants to use the federal government to go into states where pot was legalized by the state. He wants to use the federal government to raid dispensaries. Now, it, it's no different than what Obama did. So I think we should stop being hypocrites. Let's make immigration more pleasant to incentivize legal immigration. Why? Well, we if we do that, instead of spending so much money on the border, we can properly allocate funds to stopping criminals. If we make immigration more pleasant, which means making it easier, giving out more work visas, then guess what? We won't have people trying to sneak in. These immigrants will be willing to go through the checkpoints. If you make immigration easier, if you make it simpler, if you make it as simple as background check, disease check, what are your skills, done, come in, you make it that easy, you will have a fluctuation of illegal immigrants checking in through the border, going through the checkpoint, because they have nothing to fear. And that way, it'll be easier to find that illegal immigrant who is sneaking through the country, who has something to hide. I don't get why this is something hard for nationalists. I mean, I, I'm in some way nationalist. I don't get why it's so hard for border hawks to understand this concept. You incentivize legal immigration, not by giving them money, but just by making it easier for them to come in. And then boom. All the good people are coming in through the choke point because they're not afraid to get turned back. If somebody's sneaking in, it's either because they have a disease and they know they won't make it past the checkpoint, or they're a wanted fugitive and they know they won't make it past the checkpoint. So while we're talking about immigration, no, let's talk about immigration later. Let's do that. Let's, let's do that. But let's talk about the national Donald Trump wanting to use the National Guard to guard borders. So, I don't know if Oregon ever would have been called on. <laughs> I don't know if the governor of Oregon would ever have been called on to use the National Guard to go down to Texas or to New Mexico or any border state. I don't know if Donald Trump would have done that, but if he did, I 100% agree with her. These are strange times, ladies and gentlemen. Donald Trump made me agree with a left-wing Democrat. So, I want to talk about two things. I want to talk about Pase Comitatus and the role of the National Guard. Under National Guard regulation, before I continue on with Pase Comitatus, the National Guard isn't to be used for law enforcement. Except for the most radical circumstances imaginable where they need to keep order if civilian law enforcement has failed <clears throat> but Donald Trump hasn't just called on the National Guard well also let's go over this one fact the president cannot use the National Guard for law enforcement the National Guard falls in the jurisdiction of the states and if the governor wants to help another state and that other state wants help then the National Guard can operate in other states let's say Governor Jerry Brown of California has civil unrest but Oregon's doing just fine so Jerry Brown goes up to Kate Brown of Oregon and says hey can I use your National Guard we have civil unrest we have violence can you can you send some National Guard so Governor Kate Brown of Oregon says yeah sure I got your back buddy and then what does she do? She sends the National Guard. That's legal. What is not legal is the militarization of the border. Donald Trump, the federal government, cannot legally militarize the border. So for all you border hawks, you either love the Constitution or you don't. Let's look at the Posse Comitatus Act. 
So what is the Posse Comitatus Act? Well, it's a U.S. Code. Title 18, Part 1, Chapter 67, se Subsection 1385, or 1385, or 1385. For anybody that wants to look it up, I'll say it again. Title 18, Part 1, Chapter 67, Subsection 1385. And it reads, Whoever, except in cases, and under circumstances, expressly authorized by the Constitution or Act of Congress, willfully uses any part of the Army or the Air Force, and it has been, uh, just so we're clear, it only says Army and Air Force, but it has been expanded to mean the Navy and the Air Force. Not, not the Air Force, the Navy and the Marines. As posse, comitatus, or otherwise, to execute the laws shall be fined under this title, or imprisoned not more than two years, or both. <clears throat> so, let's break down what does posse comitatus even mean. Well, posse means a body of men, typically armed, summoned by a sheriff to enforce the law. Comes from the mid 17th century from medieval Latin, literally power, which is from the word, from the Latin word posse, which is be able. Comitatus is a body of well-born men attached to a king or a chieftain by the duty of military service. So, basically the head of state. And for the United States, the head of state or the equivalent to a king is president. Besides, constitutionally having less power. At least that's, you know, what the Constitution basically alludes to. So, state governors are exempt from posse comitatus. The National Guard may only be used under state authority unless giving explicit permission to the president, which has to also get permission from Congress, especially if they're not being used for war. So let's read on Posse Comitatus. Posse Comitatus, the law, the act, has its roots in the Civil War. For any of you libertarians out there, you understand. Abraham Lincoln. The dude was a tyrant. Whether or not you agree with the South, you can still agree that Abraham Lincoln did some tyrannical stuff. <clears throat> so, this article was written in 2005 around Hurricane Katrina. And has to do with George W. Bush. And it goes over what posse comitatus is. And I think this article is perfect because it was relevant and still is relevant. And it basically sums up what I'm trying to say. Having already wrecked a legendary American city, Hurricane Katrina, may now be invoked to undermine a fundamental principle of American law. When it comes to domestic policing, the military should be a last resort, not a first responder. On September 26th, President Bush urged Congress, this is 26th of, 20, of 2005, by the way, President Bush urged Congress to consider revising federal laws so that the U.S. military could seize control immediately in the aftermath of a natural disaster, noting that it may require change of law. The law the President seems to be referring to is the Posse Comitatus Act, the long-standing federal statute that restricts the government's ability to use U.S. military as a police force. Senator John Warner, Republican from Vermont, chairman of the Armed Services Committee, also has signaled his de or sorry, Virginia. Excuse me. Also has signaled his desire to change the law. Pentagon spokesman Lawrence D. Rita called Posse Comitatus a very archaic statute that hampers the presidential's ability to respond to a crisis. Not so. The Posse Comitatus Act is no barrier to federal troops providing logistical support during natural disasters, nor does it prohibit the president from using the army to restore order in ex extraordinary circumstances, even over the objection of a state governor. What it does is set a high bar for the use of federal troops in a policing role that reflects America's traditional distrust of using standing armies to enforce order at home. A distrust that's well justified. 
there are good reasons to resist any push towards domestic militarization. As one federal court has explained, military personnel must be trained to operate under circumstances where the protection of constitutional freedoms cannot receive the consideration needed in order to assure their preservation the Posse Comitatus statute is intended to meet that danger. So what they are saying in this article is that soldiers are literally terminators. If you read the US Constitution, it does not it is the Constitution is a security blanket to protect individuals from the government, from the force of government. Because the government has a monopoly on violence, whether you're an anarchist or a social, the most centralized government advocate. Government has a monopoly on force. That's just a fact. Which is, is good in a way because they need to be able to enforce laws to protect individuals from violence. They need to uphold contracts. They need to keep the peace. <clears throat> but soldiers are not police. They are not peacekeepers. They are arbiters of destruction, which is how they should be. I don't want my military going overseas to police. I want my military, our military as an American, to go overseas, blow shit up, be a wrecking ball, kill bad guys or anybody who threatens the national security of the United States, take their women and children out into fields, and burn down their village in front of them and say, if you don't, Get in line. This is what will happen to you. We will burn you, your husbands, your homes, your country, your government to the ground. Your military will suffer a humiliating defeat. Your soldiers, we will make them look like little girls. Stand down. Tell your husbands, tell your government, tell your neighbors to stand down. Or hell will come your way. That is the point of a military. It's not to keep peace, therefore they should never be deployed within borders of the United States except in extraordinary circumstances. Army Lieutenant General Russell Honor, commander of the federal troops helping out in New Orleans, seemed to recognize that danger when he ordered his soldiers to keep their guns pointed down. This isn't Iraq, he said. Soldiers are trained to be warriors, not peace officers, which is as it should be. Putting put full putting full time warriors into a civilian policing situation can result in a serious collateral damage to American life and liberty. It can also undermine military readiness, because when soldiers are forced into the role of police officers, their war fighting skills degrade. That's what the General Accounting Office concluded in a 2003 report looking at some of the Homeland Security missions the military was required to carry out after September 11th, 2001. According to the report, while on domestic military missions, combat units are unable to maintain proficiency because these missions provide less opportunity to practice the varied skills required for combat and consequently offer little training value. The GAO also concluded that such missions put a serious strain on military having heavily committed abroad, already heavily committed abroad. American law calls for civilian peace officers to keep the peace or failing that National Guard troops under the command of their state governors. So perhaps we should stop treating the National Guard as if it's no different than the Army Reserve. <clears throat> so as Katrina hit landfall, there were 7,000 Louisiana and Mississippi Guard troops deployed in Iraq, plus uh, 3,700 members of the Louisiana's 256th Mechanized Infantry Brigade who took with them high water vehicles and other equipment that could have been used in New Orleans. But that's not what happened. The guard personnel at home, they had only one they had sorry, they had only one satellite phone for the entire Mississippi Gulf Coast when Katrina initially hit. Because the others were in Iraq. 
Lieutenant General Stephen Blum, chief of the National Guard Bureau, noted, had the Louisiana Guard been at home and not in Iraq, their expertise and capabilities could have been brought to bear. So this is an important lesson. What Donald Trump is spewing is illegal to militarize the border. I mean, you could put military there and they can provide logistical support. We went over that. But they cannot enforce the law, which is as he is advocating for. The National Guard from the states can, from the border states can. And if the, the governors of these states ask for help from nearby states... So if New Mexico <laughs> wants to get help from Idaho and Oregon, they are more than willing. If California wants Oregon's help to guard the border, they are more than willing. And if they are more than willing, they are more than welcome to. But Donald Trump federalizing the military to protect the border is illegal. And I know that's going to piss off a lot of border hawks out there. But listen, my job here is to talk about issues that I see. Talk about news that is happening. Talk about current events. And try to explain it under the guise of either libertarianism or constitutionalism. Because those are my beliefs. I believe in life, liberty, and property. And I believe that the proper role of government should be protecting life, liberty, and property. That's it. That's really it. I don't know. I mean, I wish border hawks who claim to love the Constitution would at least see this. I, I wish they would actually pick up the United States Constitution, read the preamble, read all the way through the Bill of Rights, and every single amendment made to the Constitution. The federal government has no authority to deport immigrants. The only time, or the only things that they can do with immigration, this comes from James Madison. And for those of you who don't know history, James Madison is the father of the Constitution. He wrote the thing, and he wrote the Bill of Rights. James Madison strictly said, under the Constitution, the federal government only has authority to block immigrations from countries that we have declared war on, and we get to decide, we get to legislate a path for naturalization. Nothing about deportation. That's up to the states, ladies and gentlemen. Deportation only if they are an enemy to the state. And just sneaking in doesn't make you an enemy to the state. If we declared war on North Korea and a North Korean found their way into the United States, or North Korean from North Korea found their way into the United States, then we have a right to deport them. They can, they can try to seek asylum. That's their prerogative. What we do after that, I don't know. It depends on the circumstances given. That's what the Constitution says. So if you're a constitutionalist, you s declare yourself a constitutional conservative, you declare that we should go back to the Constitution, then act like it. Be consistent. I know I sound like I'm whining. Be consistent. The United States Constitution does not give the federal government authority to deport people for no good reason at all. And sneaking in is not a good reason. If if you find an illegal immigrant who didn't go through the border and you do a back you can put them in temporary confinement, do a background check, do a disease check, if they have any of that, deport them because then they are an enemy to the state. They pose a threat. They're a fugitive in another country. They are a threat. If they can spread a virus that could wipe, that Americans haven't been exposed to, or that we're not vaccinated against, or just a deadly virus in general, then they are an enemy to the state. Send them back, or put them in prison. Whatever. <laughs> All right, I went on that little rant there. I sounded like a whiny little toddler, but whatever. Thank you for listening to the Logan for Liberty podcast. This was episode three, Machine Guns and States Rights. Have a good day.